Do you have experienced uh, a night when suddenly the light was turned up? turn off uh, or light, light is out rather. So there was brownout and then suddenly there was dark all over the place and you cannot see what, what is around you. You try to find a candle or any source of light and you are really groping where you would find the light. Just imagine with me if it will take the whole night without light and there was darkness all over. It would be really something that is terrifying when there is no light. But when there is brownout and the light uh, comes, we are so glad, we're so happy. <laughs> oh, there's the light and you suddenly, your very mood uh, changes because now there is light. Now, we are uh, looking at the seven miraculous signs of our Lord Jesus Christ in the Gospel of John. So just uh, to go back and finish our series on the seven miraculous signs of the Lord Jesus Christ in the book of John. And we, uh, we have seen that these miraculous signs have a purpose. And the very purpose of these seven miraculous signs is to reveal the person and work of our Lord Jesus Christ. As I have read again and again, John 20, 30 to 31, it tells us that now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So we see that John carefully selected these seven miraculous signs for this very purpose. And we will miss the point of these miraculous signs if we don't see Jesus through them. Because the very purpose of this miraculous sign is to, Je to see Jesus through them. And now we are now on the sixth miraculous, sixth miraculous sign, the healing of the man born blind in John chapter 9, verses 1 to 41. Now we read here in John chapter uh, 9, in verse 3, we have the purpose for which this sign was performed by the Lord Jesus Christ in John chapter 9 and verse 3. Now, verse 2, his disciple asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? But the Lord's answer was, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this was so that the works of God might be manifested in him so clearly we have the, this miraculous sign was meant to show the power of the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Because that is what was said in verse 3, that uh, this was so that the works of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, might be manifested in Him. And so also we find in chapter 9, verse 32, that this miraculous sign is not just a miraculous sign, but it is an extraordinary sign among the other miracles of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have what, is, uh, what we have in verse 32. Since the beginning he, uh, here, uh, the, uh, the, blind, the man born blind was being interrogated by the Pharisees. And then he answered them, since the beginning of time, it has never been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. And so the man was saying, look, I was conceived in my mother's womb blind. In my mother's womb, I did not see light. And when I got out of my mother's womb, it's still darkness. I did not see light. We all have the same experience in one way or the other because we all came from our mother's womb. 
And if you know, darkness is inside the womb of our parents, of our mothers, rather, <laughs> not the father, the mother. And it, it's darkness there. But the moment we are delivered out of, from the womb of our mother, we see light. But this man, when she was uh, delivered out of the womb of her mother, it's still darkness because it's a congenital disease that he was born blind. Could you imagine the gravity of the condition of this man? There are others whom Christ gave eyesight. Remember in Mark 8, 22, the uh, blind at Bethsaida? And in Jericho, Luke 18, 35, the blind man there whom Jesus restored the sight? But here, it's not simply that Jesus restored the lost sight, or perhaps because blind, the person was blind for reason, but from prenatal condition, he was already blind. So I said he was in darkness in the womb, but came out still in darkness. But you know what uh, Sinclair Ferguson said about this man born blind? He said that this is a picture of the spiritual blindness of sinners who are spiritual dead. Like from the very womb of their mothers, they are already spiritually blind in total darkness. Even when they were born, they are still spiritually blind in total darkness because of sin. Now, you know, in the Old Testament, the giving of sight is associated with the power and grace of God. When we read, for example, Exodus 4.11, Then the Lord said to him, Who has made man's, man's mouth? Who makes him mute, or deaf, or seeing, or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now, the giving of sight and the taking away of the sight is the Lord within the Lord's power. And within the Lord's grace, we only have the sight because of God's grace. The moment He takes away our seeing, our, uh, our, 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 the sight of seeing, we, it, it can happen anytime to all of us. In Psalm 146, verse 8, The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. So it is the Lord who opens up the eyes of the blind. It is in the power of God to give or take away any um, uh, um, sight of a person. Yet also we find in the prophets that it is a messianic motive. In Isaiah 29, 18, it tells us when the, when the Messiah comes in that day, the deaf shall hear the words of a book, and out of their gloom and darkness and darkness, the eyes of the blind shall see. It is part of the gospel dispensation when the, the Messiah shall come, it, those who are blind will see. And in the passage we read a while ago in Isaiah 35, verse 5, then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstop. So when the Messiah comes, this will be the blessing for the Lord's people. The blind will see. And then in chapter 42 of Isaiah verse 7, I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for, for the nations to open the eyes that are blind to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. Now, the whole point of this is that this miraculous sign that we have in chapter 9 of the book of John is to reveal Christ as the Messiah whom the Old Testament prophesied. He is the coming Messiah who fulfilled, about, uh, who fulfilled the prophecy that those who are blind will see. And this man is one of that example that Jesus Christ came to give sight to the blind. Now, the Jews should know that this sign is the sign of the coming of the Messiah. 
But what they did is that they rejected Christ as the Messiah. That's ironical because they should know that this is the prophecy of the Old Testament that the blind shall, shall see. And when the Lord Jesus Christ opened the eyes of the blind, they still rejected Christ as the Messiah. Now, this sign corresponds to the second I am in chapter 8 and verse 12 where the Lord Jesus Christ said there again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So the motive of Christ as light is very clear in the book of John. So the passage we read in chapter 1 immediately we see John presenting Christ as the light of the world whom the Jews rejected. Verse 5, And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overtake it. There was a man having been sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light. But he came to bear witness about the light. There was the true light which, coming into the world, enlightens everyone. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. That's the sad thing about it. The light has come in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, but instead of uh, accepting, receiving the light, they rejected the light. The same thing in John chapter 3, and we read 19 to 21. At, and this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light, so that the deeds, his deeds may be manifested as having been done by God. So Christ was the light that has come but was rejected. In other words, Christ as light is the final revelation of God. Christ as light in the book of John is that he is the truth that has come to reveal the very truth of God. So darkness we see here is a picture of spiritual blindness to the truth. And yet light is the truth that dispels that, the spirit, that spiritual blindness. That why, that's why Jesus says, I am the light, which is all, almost the same as saying, I am the truth. I give light to this dark world. I give light to the spiritually blind uh, world who are uh, spiritually blind uh, uh, People, I give light, I give, I give them the truth so that they will see the truth of God. So that is the motive of light. Christ as light is the one who reveals the very truth of God. He came as the light of salvation. So those who see the light, those who receive the light, receive the salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ because they accept the light of Christ, the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the story here in chapter 9 is long, but the miracle account is only found in verses 1 to 7 of chapter 9. Then, the rejection of the Pharisees, beginning verse 8 to 34, and finally, the coming to faith of the man born blind. So, the message of this uh, message in this uh, a miraculous sign is that Jesus, the Son of God, is the only one that can remove spiritual blindness and grant eyesight to see the light of the gospel of Christ. 
That is the message here that Jesus, the Son of God, is the only one that can remove spiritual blindness and grant eyesight to see the light of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the verse in our outline is in verses 1 to 7, the miraculous sign itself. Let's take up this miraculous sign. We read in chapter 8, verse 1, that Jesus... went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again into the temple, and all the people were coming to him, and he sat down and began to teach them. So Jesus went up to the Mount of Olives, overlooking the temple of Jerusalem, and the pool of Shiloam, or means sense. It is significant, it's a significant motive in the gospel, because Christ was sent by the Father. And so in the morning, he came again into the temple, and many are coming to him, not only for healing, but to hear him, hear him teach in verse 2. That is what we read. Now, it was also in that chapter, in chapter 8, which we read in verse 12, when he said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And then we find that uh, in verse, chapter 8, verse 59, after Jesus claimed the title of Yahweh, when he, said, when he said in verse 58, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. I am Yahweh. I existed even before Abraham was. I am eternal. I was there before Abraham, and they could, not believe, they could not accept it. So what they did in verse 59 is that they picked up stones to throw at him, and, but Jesus hid himself, went out of the temple. So he went out of the temple because the Jews were picking up stones for claiming that he was before Abraham. And uh, going out of the temple, then we see the Lord Jesus Christ here, passing uh, through the gate in verse 1 of chapter 9. And he, as he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciple asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? Now, we see his disciple ask him, who sinned this man or his parents, that he was born blind? His disciples was with him, were with him, and they saw this man born blind. And the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ present two possibilities why this man was born. Either this man sinned or his parents sinned. That is their uh, 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 assessment of the matter. Either this man sinned or his parents sinned. That, was, that is why he was born blind. But you will notice the Lord's answer is that he said in verse 3, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this was so that the works of God might be manifested through him. Now, if Jesus gave an answer, he might have said, This could happen to anyone because of sin. But he answered, this happened with a great, with a purpose, namely, that the works of God may be displayed. At this, mo at this time, Jesus was not interested in their question whether this man sinned or his parents sinned, uh, the reason why he was born blind. But Jesus tells them, this happened with a purpose, namely, that the works of God may be displayed. Now, from here, you will see that Jesus is in control of the situation. He knows what is going on, and he is in, on top of the situation. And he is the one who arranged this, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, incident so that he will be his works, his powers as the Son of God will be displayed. So here Jesus wants 
to direct the attention of His disciples to Him as the Son of God, who not only has the power to give eyesight to the blind, but to show that He is the light that they can dispel the spiritual darkness of sinners in their depravity. So the condition of the blind man from birth speaks of our hopelessness and reveals to us that Christ is our only hope of being delivered from spiritual darkness. Now look at how the miracle was done by the Lord Jesus Christ in verses 6 and 7. And what Jesus said there is that uh, he spat on the ground, made clay of saliva, and rubbed the clay on the eyes of the man. So that is what the Lord Jesus Christ did. He anointed the, this man's eyes with that, with his saliva mixed with that, uh, with that um, probably soil, and then form some mud, and then apply it to the eyes of this man. And Jesus tells him, Go, was in the pool of Siloam. So the man went and was and came back seeing. Upon washing his eyes at, uh, he, at uh, the pole of Siloam, and he, 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 he received the, his eyesight. But when he received his eyesight, you will notice that, he was no long, uh, that Jesus was no longer around when he received his eyesight. Probably upon receiving his eyesight, he was looking for Jesus. But Jesus was not around. Now, I could imagine the joy. Maybe this blind man who now can see, maybe jumping and running and shouting for the first time, I now can see. Now, imagine with me. This, this uh, poor man had not seen the light from the womb, and uh, even after he was born, he did not see the light, but for the first time, he can see the light. He can see things around him. And I could not imagine that this man would simply be nonchalant, indifferent in his attitude of such a miraculous blessing of receiving his eyesight, which he did not have even inside the womb of his mother's. So John did not record that, of course. But I could imagine that's how this blind man who now can see uh, reacted to that miracle that happened to him. Now, his neighbors who knew his condition were astounded, yet some mistook him to be another man. So we read in verse 8, the neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, it is he. Others said, no, but he is like him. But he kept saying, I am the man. Look, I am the man. You know me. I was here almost every day, probably. You see me sitting and begging, and you know me that I am born blind. I am the man. And so, in verse 10, they said to him, If you are the man, then how were your eyes opened? So they cannot believe that something, this great thing can happen to this man born blind. Again, he answered in verse 11, The man called Jesus made mad and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to, Sil go to Siloam and was. So I went and was and received my sight. And they said to him, but where is he, this Jesus whom you are saying? He said, I do not know, because Jesus was not around. Now, I want you to ponder upon this. Something happened, an extraordinary miracle. A man born blind can now see. Before their eyes, an impossible thing can happen. Before their eyes, this miracle happened. And who could have done this except God? 
No one can give sight to a man born blind, but Jesus made the impossible. This miracle, which only God can do, was done by Jesus. Again, my brethren and my friends, at this point, the people here, even the blind man who was given eyesight, may, they may not have realized here that Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah. But for us, we know that we have Jesus who has the power to remove blindness. This is Yahweh in the flesh. As John have so arranged these seven miraculous signs so that we would know that Jesus is the Son of God and believing Him, they, we, they, we might have eternal life. And this is indeed the Son of God who came in the flesh and was the power over every eyesight who can take and who can give eyesight even to those who are born blind. The power of God was displayed. What is in the saliva and the mud, we might ask? Nothing. There is no power in the saliva and the mud. But Jesus used it to display His power as the Son of God. He has the power to give sight to a man born blind. My brethren and my friends, we should again respond in the way the hymn tells us, Who is he in yonder stall? Tis the Lord, no wondrous story. Tis the Lord, the King of glory. At his feet we humbly fall. Crown him, crown him, Lord of all. This is your Jesus. This is the Jesus who gave, who gave eyesight to this man born blind. He is God in the flesh with the power to give eyesight to the blind. Let us bow, our head, bow ourselves and worship this King of glory, this Lord, the King of glory. Let our feet humbly fall and say, crown him, crown him, Lord of all. Now the second thing we see is that the Pharisees rejected Jesus as the light. They rejected Jesus as the Messiah. The light who has come to dispel the spiritual blindness, they rejected him. Now you note here is that because of the neighbors of the man born blind who now can see, and because for them Jesus was not around, they could not see Jesus there, they went then to the religious authorities, which are the Pharisees. So we read in verse 13, they brought to the Pharisees the man who was formerly, formerly blind. So they brought to the Pharisees this man. And what was the occasion when the man was healed by the Lord Jesus again? It was the Sabbath day. As in the healing of the lame man, it was the Sabbath day. The Sabbath was made for man. It was for the good of man. Yet, Jesus did this good thing to this blind man born blind, and he gave, he gave eyesight to this man. Yet, what they see is that Jesus was a violator of the Sabbath. He is a, a Sabbath breaker. And so the Pharisees did their own investigation here. So what we read in verse 15, so the Pharisees also were asking him again, how will he receive his sight? And he said, and he said to them, he applied clay to my eyes, and I watched, and I see. Now, he has said this again and again. I think the third time when he was asked how he now can see. He simply is repeating his uh, testimony. He put mud on my eyes, and I was, and I see. So instead of seeing the extraordinary miracle and the sign from God for the Messiah, now they accuse Jesus as lawbreaker. 
Now, in verse 16, we read this. So then some of the Pharisees were saying, this man is, now, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. Jesus is a, law break, is a Sabbath breaker. But others were saying, how can a, a, a simple man do such things? Sign, uh, do such signs? And there was a division among them. So they were now divided. Some say, oh, how can he be a sinner, a Sabbath breaker, when we see that this miracle uh, that happened, a man born blind, but now has received his eyesight. So that is now the situation. There is now a division among the Pharisees they themselves. They cannot deny the miracle before their eyes, yet they could not accept the truth that Jesus is indeed the one who performed this miracle on this man. And so they are simply probably asking, who is this Jesus really is? Why is he able, if it is true, to, to give sight to this man born blind? And again, in verse 17, the man was asked again, therefore they said to the blind man again, what do you say about him? Since he opened your eyes. And he said, he is a prophet. Now at this point, we see that the healed man can only say he is a prophet. Because a prophet like Moses, Elijah, and Elijah are miracle workers. So he can say that Jesus is a prophet because he has done this miracle like the prophets in the Old Testament. And so they did further investigation. What they now do in verse 18, let us summon the parents of this blind man. They concluded maybe Israel is not really blind after all. He is faking his blindness. He was not given eyesight, but he really can see. He simply pretended to, uh, to, to, to be blind. So they summoned the parents, and uh, the parents were asked, Is this your son, who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? Now, his parents answered, We know that this is our son, and it, he was born blind. It, they testified that indeed their son was born blind. But in verse 30, 21, they said, But how he now sees, we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. Now, John uh, gave a commentary in verse 22 why his parents, probably his parents know that it was uh, Jesus indeed who healed the son, the, their son. But uh, John said his parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should co confess Jesus to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Just like what they did to this man born blind and was healed because he testified that it was Jesus who healed, who healed him. He was thrown out of the synagogue. Now his parents also feared that they too will be thrown out of the synagogue. And so they're simply, they simply said, he is of age, ask him. He is responsible, ask him. He will answer you who, uh, who healed him. And furthermore, we see the continuing interrogation. Now, you see, this is a kind of interrogation now which we read in verse 24. Therefore, a second time, they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. Now, that repeated badgering question to the man is to make him deny the miracle himself. For the second time, they called the man who has been blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. Give glory to God. Say that this Jesus 
is a sinner. He's a violator of Sabbath and that he did not heal you. So he answered again, whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. He would not retreat on his testimony. Yes, I was blind, but now I see. That is his repeated answer to the badgering questions of the Pharisees to him. He wouldn't deny the miracle that was done by the Lord Jesus Christ. So in verse 27, he answered them again. I told you already, siguro nakulitan na siya. I told you already, you did not listen. Why do you want to listen again? <laughs> do you want to become his disciples too? So that is a very much uh, straightforward question to them. Why do you keep on asking? I already told you that I was blind and now I can see. I attest to that fact that this Jesus was the one who healed me, who gave me this eyesight. But why do you keep on asking me, do you also want to, be his, to become his disciples? Probably now they are becoming interested because of this sign that they cannot really make this person deny the, the miraculous uh, uh, deed by the Lord Jesus Christ. He said in verse uh, uh, 30, so the man answered, uh, no, verse 28, they tell him, you are his disciples, but we are the disciples of Moses. That's the issue of the Jews. They are disciples of Moses, but not Jesus. Now we know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. We know, we know Moses, but we do not know this Jesus. And the man answered in verse 30, Why? This is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes again. He confronts them. You are saying you do not know where he comes from, but the evidence is before you. I'm here. I can now see. I was born blind, and I can now see. And he said in verse, 30, uh, in verse 31, we know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. And then it is stated a fact that never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. In the mind of this person who was born blind, he could not recall in history that a person who was conceived blind and was born still blind, and now that he is aged, he is still blind, and now he can see because of Jesus. In the history, that has not happened yet before. It is now only this time that such a thing happened, that a man born blind now can see. And so his conclusion in verse 33, if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. He is now testifying for the very power of the Lord Jesus Christ as God himself. He tells them, if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. He is yet an unbeliever at this point, but he could not deny that what Jesus did is a something that only God can do. Because if he is not God, he could not have done this miracle that what I know have not happened in the history of humankind. So you see, the healed man now is telling the Pharisees that whoever this Jesus was, he believes him as having the power of God. Yet the self-righteous and arrogant Pharisees, what did they do? Again, they threw him out of the gate or the synagogue. And what, uh, what they answered him, he said in verse 34, you were born in utter sin 
And would you teach us? And they, and they cast him out. So here are the self-righteous, proud, boastful Pharisees. Instead of believing what this man is telling them, he said simply, they tell them, you are born in utter sin. For him to be born blind is an utter sin. And he has no authority or even how could he have the gods to even teach them. And so they cast him out. I want you to point, uh, to ponder upon this situation here. We read in the letter of Paul to the Corinthians in his second letter, chapter 4, 3 to 4. And there Paul tells the Corinthian Christians, the God of this age, Satan, has blinded the unbelieving, that they might not see the light of the gospel of the, Lord, of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. And this is what is happening with these Pharisees. Satan has blinded the unbelieving, these Pharisees. They cannot see the light of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now is the light before them. By they reject Christ, they reject the light, they reject the truth. Christ who is the image of God. So we see that man cannot by himself believe because Satan continues to blind the unbelieving until the Holy Spirit works and remove that blindness that in Christ they will see the truth that he is the hope of sinners to receive his spiritual sight and be saved. The same thing in Luke 16, 27 to 31. You know the story of the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. And Lazarus and the rich man both died. And Lazarus went to uh, uh, the bosom of uh, Abraham. And the rich man was tormented in, the, in, the, in hell. And so the suffering rich man in hell was concerned of his siblings who were, who were left behind. And so he asked Abraham to send someone to warn them to avoid the torments of hell. I still have my siblings there. Please send somebody, uh, uh, probably a person who, who rise from the dead can convince them that they should believe so that they can be saved and will be, and will be delivered from this torment in hell. Now you will realize the reply of the Lord Jesus Christ to this man in verse 31 in Luke chapter 16. There is no amount of miracle, even rising from the dead, can save the people. They must repent and believe, and they will be saved. They have the words of Moses. They must repent and believe so that they will be saved. And this is the tragic condition of the Pharisees and all men that are spiritually blind. Don't wait for a miracle before you believe. No amount of miracle can make you believe what you are being called now is at this moment you repent and believe the Lord Jesus Christ and pray that God will give you spiritual eyesight so that you might, you might see the light of the gospel in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ who is the light of the world so that you will be saved from the condemnation in hell. And so may your prayers be with the hymn that we sang a while ago. Open my eyes that I may see glimpses of truth thou hast for me. Place in my hands the wonderful key that shall unclasp and set me free. Silently now I wait for thee. Ready, my God, thy will to see. Open my eyes, illumine me, Spirit divine. And you will never, never see the light in Christ until you beg the Holy Spirit to open your eyes and give you spiritual insight. So I beg you, my friend, if until now you are still like the Pharisees who are blind to the spiritual truths, 
may you pray and beg the Spirit to remove your spiritual blindness and give you spiritual eyesight to see the glory of Christ in the gospel so that you will believe and be saved. Now, finally, the conversion of the man born blind. This is what we read in verses 35 to 41. Note here that Jesus was around all along. He was not away. <laughs> he was not, you know, unaware of what is happening to this man born blind. In other words, he is in, again in control of the whole incident. His purposes are being accomplished through this man. He is watching his child in coming to faith in him. He was there. He was simply there. And so when this blind man who now can see was thrown out of the synagogue, Jesus was there. Jesus knows. He was there. And waiting for that moment when he will ask the, the man blind a soul-searching question. Do you believe that I am the son of man? This is a um, um, wonderful thing to meditate upon. When you come, came to faith in Christ, he was there. He was around. Just like this man. He was thrown out. He was not Somewhere, not knowing what is happening. He was all along there, waiting for that time as he purposed it to come to this man and ask the soul-searching question, do you believe the son of man? So my friends, let us just simply recall that moment of our conversion when you came to faith, Jesus was there. And He gave you a sp the spiritual eyesight. That's why you believe. And God said, there. Because if Jesus was not there, how would you believe? It was there, Jesus, uh, it, Jesus was there and gave you the spiritual eyesight. And you repented and you believed and you God say, but let me challenge our friends. She is also watching you now. Just like here, he was all along there, around. Now perhaps he is watching you to come to faith in him. Maybe this is the moment of faith for you. Maybe this is now the time that Christ is calling you and giving you this soul-searching question. Do you believe in the Son of Man? And if Christ is waiting for you there, you cannot do anything but say, Yes, I believe. With the, with the man born blind, this was the hour of his faith. So in verse 35, Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and having found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? In the New King James Version, it, it tells, do you believe in the Son of God? But the right translation is, do you believe in the Son of Man? Now, this question of the Lord Jesus Christ to this man, to this man born blind is a, question, uh, uh, is a question of saving faith. It's not simply a question of trust Jesus. No, it's a question of saving faith. What is saving faith? Saving faith is understanding the truth. Saving faith is accepting the truth. Saving faith is trusting the truth. And this is what Jesus is doing to this man. The truth is, I am the son of man. Do you understand that? Do you believe that? No, if you do, do you accept that? So the soul-searching question by the Lord do you believe in the Son of Man? As if the Lord is asking this man, do you believe me for who I am? Do you believe me that I am the Son of God who became flesh? Do you believe that I am the light of the world, 
that I came to tell you that I am the truth that has come so that you will know the truth. That I came so that your spiritual blindness will be removed from you and you will see me for who I am. And in verse, uh, you know, in verse 17, the, 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 the man born blind simply understood Christ after that miracle as a prophet. But here, he's more than a prophet. Jesus is saying, I am the son of man. Do you believe that? Now, this task title is not simply saying that Jesus Christ was truly man. No, that is not the meaning of this title of the Lord Jesus Christ, the son of man. The son of man is the son of man in the vision of Daniel in the Old Testament in chapter 7. And we read there in Daniel chapter 7, Just a short look at it. We see in Daniel chapter 7, 13 and 14, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like the Son of Man was coming. Do you know? Do you get it? Who is the Son of Man? It was Jesus. It is Jesus who is coming out of heaven. He is the Son of Man. He came up to the ancient, ancient of days and, in, and came near before him. And to him was given dominion to the Son of Man, glory and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every tongue might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not be taken away. And his kingdom is one which will not destroy the Son of Man is the title of the Lord Jesus Christ as the exalted Savior, Redeemer, who is glorious in heaven, the eternal, omnipotent God Himself. This is the Son of Man in the vision of Daniel. The Son of Man who is eternal, who is from everlasting to everlasting, whose kingdom cannot be destroyed. This is the Son of Man here when Jesus asked the blind man, do you believe in the Son of Man? Do you believe that I am the exalted Lord, the sovereign Lord, the everlasting potentate of time, the one who comes from heaven, the one who is from the ancient of days, and the answer of the blind man in verse 36 is that, And who is he, sir, that I might believe in him? Then Jesus tells him, You have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. Would you? That's so direct. Look, I'm standing before you. I am that son of man that, you, that I'm asking you whether you believe me or not. And we now read the confession of this man in verse 38 when it says, he said, Lord, I believe. I believe that you are the Son of Man. I believe that you are the Redeemer, the Sovereign Lord. And what he did after believing, he worshipped the Lord Jesus Christ. He understood who Christ is, accepted the truth, trusted the truth, and most importantly, he trusted the truth and worshipped the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Son of Man. That is the same soul-searching soul question for all of us. Do you believe Jesus for who he is, the Son of Man? Now, the sad truth here in this story that the Pharisees are blind. They did not see who Jesus is, and they simply, in disbelief, rejected Jesus Christ themselves. And so Jesus said in verse 39, For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who may do see may become blind. And so some of the Pharisees near him said, heard this thing and said, that, are we also blind? 
And Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. Now, what Jesus is telling them, now if you are blind, like this uh, man born blind, you will have no guilt. You will see the truth and you will be saved and be forgiven of your sins and you will stand no guilt before God. And yet now you see, you say, we see your guilt remain because they say they see, but they reject Christ for who he is. And so they remain under the condemnation of God. The blind man was blind, but was given spiritual sight to believe Christ. The Pharisees can see, but their minds are still in darkness, and they shall be judged for their unbelief. So just a final challenge to all of you. Which are you today? The blind, but can see, because he believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Or the one who can see, and yet still blind in the spiritual truths about Christ. Now, if you, Christ is not still your Lord and Savior, you are still blind until now. Now, we always, the most popular hymn that is being sung even by unbelievers is Amazing Grace. My, my, my dear brethren, I hope we can sing this. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I am found. Was blind, but now I see. That is the testimony of John Newton. He was blind. He was a sinner rejecting Christ, but Jesus opened his eyes and saw for who Christ is, and he now can see and was saved. The man born blind did not receive only physical sight, but spiritual sight as well. He was saved. And I hope you too, this very moment, you will also receive that spiritual sight that you will believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. My brethren, let us worship the Lord Jesus Christ who has given us the eyesight to understand the truth of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and now we are saved. And let's pray. Our Father, we just pray that you will help us to assimilate this, the story of this man born blind but was given eyesight by the Lord Jesus Christ. In many ways, we are just like this man. In fact, the truth is we are blind as well like this man. Though not physically blind, but we are blind to your spiritual truths. We don't accept you as the light of the world. We reject you and we reject your truth. But we thank you and praise you because you remove our spiritual blindness and you showed to us who Christ is, just like this man who received both physical eyesight and spiritual eyesight. He saw Christ for who he is. He believed him, accepted him, and trusted him wholeheartedly, and he was saved. And so we do pray for all our friends who are here, here, May you open their spiritual sight. They may see their damned condition before you and that Christ alone is their hope to be delivered from darkness so that they may see the light of the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. So we commit this to you, our Father. Help us to always recall and remember that Jesus Christ is the light of the world who came and to save us. And may we worship him with all our hearts and minds and our souls. So we thank you and we pray all these things in Christ's name.
INI